Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater located in the National Archives Building in Washington, D.C. I'm Doug Swanson, the Visitor Services Manager for the National Archives Museum, as well as the producer for the Noontime Lecture Series. Before we begin today's program, I'd just like to mention some other Black History Month programs that are going to be taking place at this location in the near future. Starting tomorrow, Saturday, February 17th, after a two-year absence, Lincoln's original Emancipation Proclamation will be on display in the East Rotunda Gallery during the President's Day weekend. President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st of 1863 as the nation approached its third year of bloody civil war. The proclamation declared that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are and henceforward shall be free. So don't miss this rare opportunity to see the original Emancipation Proclamation. The document will be made available for viewing in the museum on February 17th, 18th, and 19th between the hours of 10 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. each day. On February 22nd at noon, Noel Ray will be on hand to discuss his new book, The Great Stain, Witnessing American Slavery, in which he used firsthand and personal accounts from former slaves, slave owners, and even African slavers to tell the story. A book signing will follow the event. So to find out more about these events and our other programs and our exhibits, please check our website at www.archives.gov calendar. You'll also find some printed materials about upcoming events out in the hallway. Our guest authors for today are Chris Meyer Ash and George Derek Musgrove, who will discuss their latest book, Chocolate City, A History of Race and Democracy in the Nation's Capital. A native of Washington, D.C., Chris Myers Ash graduated from Wilson High School in the district, then attended Duke University and earned a PhD from the University of North Carolina. He taught, I'm sorry, I got new glasses and they're not really working too good for me. He taught, <laughs> he taught with Teach for America in the Mississippi Delta and co founded the Sunflower County Freedom Project in Mississippi, a nonprofit organization that uses civil rights history to inspire middle and high school students. He is the author of The Senator and the Sharecropper, The Freedom Struggles of James O. Eastland and Fannie Lou Hamer. He's the editor of Washington History Magazine and teaches history at Colby College part-time while running the Capital Area New Mainers Project, a nonprofit organization he co-founded in 2017 to work with immigrants and refugees in central Maine. George Derek Musgrove is an associate professor of history at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He's the author of Rumor, Repression, and Racial Politics, How the Harassment of Black, black Elected Officials Shaped Post-Civil War, I'm sorry, Civil Rights America, and a number of popular and scholarly articles on post-civil rights era black politics in Washington, D.C. He received his PhD in U.S. History from New York University in 2005. So please join me in welcoming Chris Myers Ash and George Musgrove to the National Archives. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, for coming out. I know it's uh, there's a long weekend ahead, and, and uh, they were saying, well, you know, maybe folks are already heading out of town, so who knows who's going to show up. But it's great to see a, a, a great crowd. Uh, we really appreciate your, your coming out to, to listen. And we're, what we're going to do is we're just going to talk for a little while. Uh, we, you know, it's, it, this is such a beautiful setting. It's, a, it's, a, it's an intimate setting. So we're, we're going to talk for a little bit and then open it up relatively quickly to questions because we're always interested in your questions and the kinds of things that, that you want to talk about. And when we do, there are microphones on either side so you can queue up uh, and make sure you use the microphones to, to ask your questions. Uh, I'd like to start today with a, with a little story. Um, our, our book is full of stories, lots of people uh, from D.C. history. And so I'd like to start with a story from 1862, uh, May 1862, to, to be precise. Uh, and if you know your American history timeline, right, that's, that's toward the front end of the, the early end of the Civil War. Uh, it's two weeks after Congress has passed the D.C. Emancipation Act. And so uh, enslaved people in Washington were the first freed. Uh, they, were, they were freed more than eight months before the Emancipation Proclamation was, was issued. Uh, and so 
we celebrate it today, April 16th, uh, is, is a city holiday for those of you who are D.C. natives. Uh, it's a city holiday. And so Congress passes the D.C. Emancipation Act, April 16th, 1862. Two weeks later, uh, a white leader in Washington, a member of the city council, and, the, and, and white leaders in Washington were almost unanimously opposed to emancipation. They were unionists. They supported the Union Army. They supported President Lincoln. Uh, but they were opposed to emancipation. And Alexander Shepard was, was among them. He was, he was a businessman, one of the wealthiest uh, men in the district. And two weeks after the Emancipation Bill is passed, he says, fine, the slaves are freed, but that's it. I hope now, and then uh, I will quote, I hope now that the discussion of the Negro question in this city is at an end, period. We're in the middle of the Civil War. We don't know when the end is. We don't know that slavery is going to be uh, abolished eventually. And Alexander Shepard has determined that we can stop talking about race, right? We're done. We did it. We emancipated the slaves. We shouldn't have to deal with this issue anymore. And I tell that story because it encapsulates the way a lot of Americans, especially white Americans, view race, right? We tend to say, look, can we stop talking about it already? Right? We, we, we dealt with that. For Alexander Shepard, it was D.C. emancipation. That was it. We, we, we did it. Enough. For other folks, it was Reconstruction. For other folks, it was Supreme Court decisions or the Civil Rights Movement or electing Barack Obama. At some point, they're, they're just tired of it. They don't want to talk about it anymore. And part of our argument in this book, part of why we call it Chocolate City, and we'll talk more about that, is that we think that approach to race is completely wrong and ultimately impossible. Race is the central fault line of district history, of Washington history, and it's a central fault line in American history. And we can't simply wish it away. We can't simply ignore it. We can't simply say, we're done with it. Let's move on. We have to understand. We have to, we have to confront it. We have to deal with it, the, the full reality of race and racial inequality in this country. Uh, and you know, Chris's story, um, you know, argues that the, uh, the, the uh, desire to ignore race is uh, a malady of a large number of uh, white Americans. Uh, but it is also, at times in this country's history, uh, something that some black Americans attempt to do as well. Uh, and so I'm going to give you a quick opening story uh, to talk about one, a very famous uh, D.C. resident who attempted to ignore race, uh, and it consumed him. Uh, in 2006, uh, famous DC uh, reporter Harry Jaffe is riding around with Adrian Fenty. Uh, and Fenty is at this moment uh, bounding towards a remarkable mayoral victory. In fact, he is the only person in this city's history uh, to basically run the table on every single demographic uh, uh, in a mayoral election. He wins every single precinct in the city. The rich ones, the poor ones, the black ones, the white ones, the Latino ones, all of them. Uh, and before that happens, before that legend of Fenty, the remarkable uh, and undefeatable candidate, uh, emerges, he's riding around with Harry Jaffe. Uh, and Fenty's a really interesting character. He's tall, light-skinned, uh, very athletic, uh, grew up in multiracial parts of the city, uh, went to the city's most multiracial schools, um, and really comes to symbolize what people would begin to call at that moment when he's running for office a post-racial black politician. Uh, other famous post-racial black politicians at the time are people like uh, Cory Booker, who's now in the Senate at the time, was the mayor of uh, Newark, uh, Archer Davis from Alabama, uh, and of course a guy that you might have heard of named Barack Obama from Illinois. Uh, and Fenty uh, really takes this idea of being post-racial seriously. Uh, Harry Jaffe is no stranger to the city's history. He knows that race is one of the central fault lines of the city's history, and so he says, you know, uh, uh, Councilman Fenty, um, what do you think about race? Because you don't talk about it. And Fenty just says right back to him, without missing a beat, I don't think about it much. You know, I talk to people all the time, and they tell me they don't care about race. They care about getting city services. They want to make sure that their neighborhood gets the same city services as other neighborhoods in the city. And to Harry Jaffe, that was positively discordant. I mean, he's like, that doesn't measure up to anything that I understand in my decades of studying this city. But okay, uh, and Adrian Fenty goes on to sort of prove his own philosophy of dealing with race, uh, apparently prove it right. 
uh, when he wins the election in 2006. Um, and this, again, was bizarre. Remember, 2006 is the height of the housing boom, uh, when poor African Americans are really being nudged out of the city, uh, more than a nudge, being shoved out of the city uh, by ballooning housing prices uh, and, and out-of-control development, uh, and are expressing their frustration with that. Um, it is three years in 2006 is after the city was declared the AIDS capital of America. We had a 3% AIDS rate, uh, and that was largely because Congress had banned needle exchanges in the city. Most of the people with AIDS in the city were African American and poor, and that was part of the discussion uh, when that was announced in 2003 and, and for years uh, afterwards. Uh, it was also two years, 2006 was, after Marion Barry heads back to the council. Uh, and when Marion Barry is part of an election, race is an issue. Right? Um, and not because he's Marion Barry, but because he reflects the city, quite frankly. Um, but Fenty ignores it. Four years later, 80% of the city's African Americans turn against him. He loses that election, even though he had $4 million in the bank. He loses that election. Um, and the main reason was because black DC residents felt like he not only ignored their issues, but he actively attempted to downplay their issues and their concerns. Um, and we can see the same thing happen on the national level. All of us celebrated, of course, when Barack Obama came to town. Uh, but then, of course, we get a very different president after him. Uh, and, of course, that's a product of the Tea Party insurgency that comes just a year after his presidency. Uh, and so there's a way in which if you attempt to ignore race, uh, it can come back and consume you. And we want to make that uh, one of the things that we push uh, in the forefront uh, of, of our book. Um, is that this is a very deep and complex problem that's at the heart of American democracy uh, and wishing it away simply won't make it go away. So why do we take this on? Why do we write this book? It's something that I, I get asked pretty much every time, especially for, during those many years. Where it took about six years to write, and, and I was always telling me, oh, I'm working on this book. Really? Why are you, why, why are you, why are you spending so much time on this issue? And, uh, you know, for me, I, I grew up here. I, I went to Wilson High School. Uh, how many... DC residents, DC natives are, are in the house. We have, we have a few, okay, right. we, got, we, we have some. Um, and you know, I grew up in the, in the 80s and I can remember in ninth grade, at that time DC history was a required course for ninth graders in the city. And I was taken at Deal Junior High School on the first day the teacher's passing out the textbooks and we're supposed to spend a whole semester on DC history, it was required. Uh, and then we'll spend the next semester on world history. And first day she says, I just wanna let you know we're only going to spend about six weeks on D.C. history because D.C. doesn't really have much history. And I, I want to emphasize that this is a D.C. public school teacher teaching D.C. public school students in a D.C. public school and basically saying your history doesn't matter. It's really just not very important. There's just not much to it. And, and I didn't know enough about D.C. history at the time to say anything back. I, you know, well, she's the teacher. Maybe she's right. But it's it stuck in my head. And so uh, you know, here we are 30 years later, and I have a very long delayed, but, <laughs> and very long, 600 page, response to her to say, no, you actually, you're wrong. Uh, DC does have a great history. There's a lot to it. There, there are many really fascinating stories that are important, not just for DC students to understand, but for all Americans to understand, because this is the nation's capital. And I think, by and large, DC does not get the respect it deserves mm -hmm. from the nation that it serves. Uh, we see this all the time. Yeah, thank you. I, there are the DC natives going up. Uh, I live in Maine now. And it's amazing to me how little people in Maine or outside of D.C. know about the city. They don't even know that we don't have senators and representatives in Congress. They're appalled when I tell them. At first, they don't really believe it. They're like, no, that can't be true. Didn't we fight a war about that? You say, yes, we did fight a war about that. And yes, it is still true. Uh, but, but people, by and large, don't understand. Even the tourists who come here don't understand what the residents of this city have to endure on a daily basis. So part of the, uh, our, my reasoning, certainly personally, for writing this book is to make a statement about the importance of D.C. and the centrality of D.C. history to the nation's history. So I, I like to characterize Chris's and, and my motivations for writing this book in, in terms of sort of movie scripts. Uh, you know, his is kind of a, a revenge narrative. You know, child is wronged and then goes off and trains with the master and comes back and defeats the, the foe. Uh, and, um, and mine is more of a romantic comedy. Um, 
So I grew up in Baltimore. I'm not a DC native, uh, and I used to we started I, <laughs> and I started coming to DC uh, because I love the culture. You know, so I, I would come here uh, as a high school student and then as a college student uh, uh, to go to the Ritz, which was actually right uh, about a couple of blocks north of here on E Street. <laughs> Uh, and it was one of the best clubs I had ever been to uh, in my life because you could find the entirety of the African diaspora in that building, right? And the first floor was hip hop. Uh, the second floor was, was uh, reggae and dance hall. Uh, the third floor was house music and sometimes they play R&B. Fifth floor was go-go. Um, fourth floor was go-go. Pardon me, I can't count. Um, and I just remember thinking this is a remarkable place. I, I would meet people you know, whose, whose parents were from Ethiopia, Jamaica, Trinidad, uh, North Carolina, Washington, D.C., all in that building. And it was just terribly exciting to me, even though I was from a very large, uh, uh, majority black city, Baltimore, right? Um, and I just remember falling in love with the city and thinking, you know, when I, when I grow up, I'm, I'm, I'm heading over there. And I did. As soon as I uh, was able to get a job in college, I came over here to teach uh, in a freedom school. Uh, on Girard and 13th Street in Columbia Heights called the Sojourners uh, Freedom School, uh, which is actually how Chris and I met. Uh, he had taught in a freedom school in Mississippi, uh, and so we bonded over that. Uh, and I pretty much uh, every single year after that stayed a little bit more in the city until I finally moved here. Um, now, the reason I moved here for good was to get a job at UDC, uh, at the University of the District of Columbia. Uh, I did not go to UDC planning on studying DC history. Uh, I focused on African American history, 20th century US politics. Uh, but one semester, my chair came to me and said, hey, you got to teach the DC history class. Um, I begged and pleaded uh, and, and said, you know, I don't know uh, much about it. Uh, can, can we leave this off to another time uh, when, I'm not, when I don't have a big project on the side? She said no. Uh, and so I, I jumped into this class with my students, uh, and they were very kind. Uh, uh, DC natives all, but they, they, they uh, dealt with me. Um, and we had an amazing time. I learned all of this remarkable history with students who really enjoyed finding out about the city's history, really wanted to know what their street looked like 80 years ago. Uh, and so after this stumbling, bumbling semester that I had had with this class, where you know, my students would come in and say, you know, didn't L'Enfant draw a pentagram in, in, the, in the streets? Uh, because he was, a, he was a Satan worshiper and a Mason. And I was like, pretty sure that's not true, but I have to go check. You know, it's a, so they'd send me back to the books all the time, right? Um, we had a really, really great time. And I tell Chris about this, kind of a self-deprecating self story. And the one thing I, I say at the end of the story is I really wish somebody had written like a nice, big, updated history of race in, in, in D.C. Uh, because I could have really used that going into my class, you know? Uh, and... and and you know, he's like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And I say, yeah, somebody should write that. Uh, and I go home. Uh, and a week later, Chris sends me a book proposal and says, you know, edit this up. You know, tell me what you think I missed and, and let's send it off. Uh, and six years later, uh, we have a book called Chocolate City uh, as a result of that. And, and you know, the, the, the title's important. And you know, people ask about the title. Uh, you know, it's a catchy title. Uh, and, and folks who are from D.C., kind of understand the, the title, uh, you know, but it's interesting because, you know, when I, when I first started uh, working on this, I, I remember I, I was having dinner with, with my wife's family and I, I told them about this project. So, you know, I'm going to start this project with this colleague of mine. Uh, it's called Chocolate City. We're going to study race. And my wife's cousin, this, you know, wonderful, liberal, uh, you know, white millennial, uh, her face just, just dropped and she was just shocked. She said, why did you call it? It's going to be called Chocolate City. And she's like, can we even say that? Are we, are we allowed to? Isn't that racist? Right? She's very worried, worried on my behalf that, that I was going to be called racist for using the very term uh, Chocolate City. And I've encountered this over and over. In fact, just a few weeks ago in Maine, I was telling somebody about it. And they, and they got this shocked look and very worried look like, oh, we, we, we can't say that. Can we? And... And it's, it's interesting to me because if you're not from D.C., you don't, you don't understand the, the power that that particular name has in this city. You know? And it's, it's certainly not a term, a negative term. It's a term of pride. It's a, it's a term of endearment. It's a, it's a term that, that black Washingtonians in particular, but white Washingtonians too, especially those of, who, of us who grew up here, really embraced and, and, and revel in. And so it seemed like the, a, a natural title for this, for this book. 
Yeah, and the term has its genesis with uh, the black majority uh, in the early 1960s. This, Washington, D.C. becomes the first major American city with a black majority population in 1957. Uh, and soon afterwards, in the early 1960s, uh, black residents in the city began using the name Chocolate City as a nickname for uh, the town. Um, local DJs pick it up on WOL, uh, and, and very quickly it becomes sort of the unofficial nickname of the city. Um, and then Parliament Funkadelic, <laughs> the high priests of funk, um, who have amazing concerts here. Uh, because they have a very large and energetic fan base, decide that they're going to take that name that they hear every time they come to the city, um, and they're going to title it for their 1975 album called Chocolate City. Uh, it has a title track, uh, and George Clinton says straight away, um, there are a lot of chocolate cities out there. You know, we've got Newark, got Atlanta, all these others, but you're the capital, CC. And he's, of course, referring to Washington, D.C., and then the rest of the country really gets a clear understanding of DC's nickname and its reason. And it, the nickname Chocolate City, City really referred to three specific things that really dominate the city's history for the second 50 years of the 20th century. The first is the black majority. Uh, there's a lot of African Americans here. Um, the second is that the city during that time is bursting with culture. Uh, it's, one of the reasons, it's one of the things that attracted me here. Uh, it's one of the things that attracted P-Funk here. Because, uh, of course, they could make a lot of money here. Um, uh, and then the third thing is that the city really embodied the aspirations of the black power movement. Uh, at the same time that city residents were calling, began calling the city Chocolate City, um, was the exact same time that the city, for the first time in 100 years, got the vote. Uh, we were able, uh, starting in 1964, to vote for president, starting in 1968 to vote for a school board, uh, in 71 to vote for a non-voting delegate to Congress, and in 73 uh, uh, to vote for a city council and a mayor. Uh, and a couple of folks got carried away, and in 1978 tried to get two senators and a member of Congress, and they almost did it, right? Um, and so that idea that, that this place, you know, those three ideas together really embody the, the, the notion Chocolate City. And so we just thought immediately, hey, perfect name, problem. We are historians, after all. We've got to keep it complicated. Uh, and we realize that we're about to write a 400-year history. I mean, we start the book in 1608 when John Smith comes up the Potomac, meets a couple of Native Americans on the uh, Anacostia side of uh, 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 the river and uh, the Nacostan. Um, and we end in 2010. Uh, and so that's a little bit bigger than the Chocolate City period. Uh, and so we had to think seriously about whether the name Chocolate City works for all of that, not just the last 50 years. Um, and Chris will tell you that it absolutely does, and, and he convinced me. <laughs> so part of our argument is that, that D.C. has been a chocolate city from the beginning, in the sense that, that whether or not at a particular point in time there's been a black majority in the city, uh, the presence of a large black population has been the, the single most important dynamic in the city's history. I mean, it, it, it has shaped the culture, the politics, how DC uh, people interact, where they live, uh, where they go to school. That, that large black population is the central dominant fact of, of DC history, going all the way back even before the beginning. You know, many of you know from your, from your U.S. history textbooks about the, you know, the most famous dinner in American history when James Madison and, and Thomas Jefferson and, and Alexander Hamilton sit down to hash out uh, where the, the U.S. capital is going to be located. And out of that uh, dinner comes an agreement to place the capital on the Potomac in exchange for uh, the assumption, federal government's assumption of debts and so forth. We go into the, the whole details of it. But, but the key point to note is slavery plays a very, very important role in that discussion, in that deal that gets made. The reason why we are here today on the Potomac and not the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania or not in Pennsylvania or anywhere else is because of slavery primarily. Jefferson and Madison and other Southerners did not want the capital of the, the new republic to be placed in the north where there was already a, a growing anti-slavery movement. They wanted it safely in a non-urban, non-cosmopolitan 
Plantation Society. What's interesting, many of you may, may be fans of Lin-Manuel Miranda and Hamilton, the, the, the great Broadway musical, and he's got this great song about that dinner where, where Aaron Burns is lamenting that he's not in the room where it happens, right? No one else was in the room where it happened, right? They cut this deal. Well, I love Miranda, but he's wrong because there were other people in that room, enslaved people. We're in that room. That dinner didn't materialize out of nowhere, right? Somebody had to cook it, and Jefferson wasn't going to do it, right? His enslaved chef was going to do it, mm -hmm. and he, they were going to serve it. They were in the room where it happened. Their presence is, is this, this kind of this very visible, if sometimes unspoken, uh, but central place that they play, that slavery plays in, in the very founding of our country and the founding of, of its capital. And, so, and from the very beginning, the city has a large black population. 30-something percent of the, of the city's population is black. It's primarily enslaved at first. Uh, but very quickly, as D.C. grows, it becomes more urban. It becomes more of a city. You know, the, the, there's still hogs and, and stuff roaming the streets for many decades, but, but it's becoming more urban. Slavery becomes less crucial to the local economy, and so more and more... Uh, of the African Americans who live in the city uh, become free. And, and by 1830, actually a majority of the, of the black population in the city is free rather than enslaved. But they're very tightly entwined. The enslaved and free black populations are very closely entwined. And DC becomes, even then, even during slavery, it becomes somewhat of a beacon of black freedom. Mm -hmm. If you are a, a, an enslaved person and you are looking you're, you're in Maryland or you're in Virginia and you're looking for a place with a bit more opportunity, you're, you're fixing to run away, you go to, to Washington, D.C. because there are free black people there. You can meld into that population. There are black, black private schools that are being set up. There are black churches, black run churches that are being set up. There are benevolent societies that, where, where the black community pools community resources to cover medical bills and, and, and funerals. Right? There are these institutions that are growing in this city. They're small, but they're powerful. There's this there are people who are fighting against slavery and fighting against the, the, the rigid regime of white supremacy. Even during slavery, you have, you have Mina Queen, who's an enslaved woman who takes a case all the way to the Supreme Court, arguing that, that her, her ancestors were free and therefore she should be free. She loses her case. But uh, less than a decade later, in 1821, a man named William Coston who's related by blood to Martha Washington, William Coston, a light-skinned black man who insists on asserting his freedom as a free black person in this country. When, when uh, the city council starts passing black codes trying to limit the freedom of free black men, he argues to the courts in the Coston v. Washington case, he argues that the Constitution knows, knows no distinction of color. He puts forth a novel and unprecedented argument about the Constitution being a colorblind document, mm -hmm. that the Constitution, that the laws of this country should be applied equally to all races. And he half wins. <laughs> so, so what the judge, Judge Cranch, who, who, who served for 50 years, uh, says is he says, okay, you got a point. But these, so he says, these laws won't apply to you, William Coston, and your family and all the free black population now but they will apply to any future free black people who come to this city, right? And then two dec dec decades later, more black codes are passed, and a guy named Isaac Carey sues again, right? They pass these codes. They say black people can't own a business in the city. He's trying to drive the black entrepreneurs out of the city. And Isaac Carey runs a perfume business. He goes on selling his perfume, and he dares people to, to arrest him, and they do, and he sues, and he wins. And the same Judge Cranch says, you're right. This is, this is wrong. These black codes are unconstitutional. Black people can and should have the right to run their own businesses. So, so D.C. is, a, is, is the, this hotbed of, of, of abolitionism, uh, of legal agitation, of, of black intellectual ferment, even during the, the antebellum years. And it blossoms after the Civil War and during Reconstruction and in the late 19th century where you have... Black intellectuals coming to this town, going to the Harvard University, teaching at Harvard University, teaching in the black public schools, which become the model for the nation. You have the largest black community in the country at the turn of the century. So D.C. becomes and, and ha has long served as 
the capital of black America as well as the capital of the United States. And so we figured, yeah, it'll work. Chocolate City works. Yeah. <laughs> I told you he'd convince you. <laughs> um, and and the, the one thing that Chris even mentioned, I just want to throw this out there, is you know, it's, it's not just that D.C. is plunked down in plantation and county and, and race sort of shapes the city's development in many of its political battles for the entire 19th century. The very shape of the city, the actual physical shape of the city is determined by issues of race and specifically issues of slavery. Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, Arlington County retrocedes itself back to uh, Virginia primarily in order to protect the uh, interstate slave trade, uh, which is booming uh, uh, in that, uh, on the other side of the river. Uh, and many of the slave dealers who were in downtown D.C., we, ha we have to remember that this is, this is old tobacco plantation uh, uh, county, right? Um, tobacco exhausts the soil. Uh, by the time you get to the early 1800s, um, there's not a lot growing outside the city limits. Uh, and so people send their slaves into the city to hire them out, to work on building projects, uh, to, to work in different small industry. Um, or they allow them to buy their freedom. And the, and the free black population, as Chris pointed out, grows very quickly until it's a majority of the black population in the city in the 1830s. But you have all these plantation owners who essentially have excess labor uh, as they convert to things like grain on the farms around the city. And so they turn the nation's capital into the largest slave selling market in the United States of America. I mean, a single firm in Alexandria, and we talk about them in, in, in the uh, book, sold 1,000 slaves a year in the 1830s. Down the river, Mississippi, Vicksburg, New Orleans, right? Um, and so, you know, you have all these abolitionists, you have a free black community that's helping to spirit African Americans north towards Canada, and you have the largest slave selling uh, concentration uh, of, of dealers uh, in the country. Uh, and so you can imagine that all of this plays out on the street in some very ugly battles. Uh, what a lot of the uh, entrepreneurs in Alexandria decided was that in order to protect their business, a very, very lucrative business, uh, what they were going to do is just head back into Virginia, a state that was dominated by slave owners uh, and who could help them to protect their trade as well. Because those abolitionists were demanding that Congress get rid of slavery in the district. Uh, and so they said, fine, we're going to leave. And now we're not a square, right? DC has this little cutout uh, along the Potomac River. Um, so, <clears throat> why should anyone care about the racial history of Washington, D.C.? That's a silly question for y'all. Y'all are in the city. Many of you are native Washingtonians. Uh, and so the, the, the it's sort of self-evident, right? Uh, you should care because I care, because I'm here, because it's my history. Um, but if you extend the question to ask why should people outside of D.C. care about this stuff, um, it actually becomes a much bigger question, and we try to address it uh, in that way. Um, one of the main reasons we think people should care what happens on, on the streets of D.C. Uh, is because it's the nation's capital uh, and the pageantry of American democracy, the symbolism of American democracy gets acted out on its streets. Um, and that's, you know, it, it is not mere symbolism, right? I mean, this is, this is a place where we present ourselves to the rest of the country as a democracy, as well as to the rest of the world. Uh, and so what happens here uh, doesn't, of course, just stay here, as Chris loves to say, right? Uh, we're not Vegas. Uh, in fact, the symbolism here really sends messages out to the rest of the country of what's okay, what's not okay. We begin the book with this quote uh, from Mary Church Terrell, a famous uh, uh, African-American uh, suffragist, uh, political activist, uh, club woman, uh, organizer. Uh, and she says this about Washington, D.C., surely nowhere else in the world do oppression and persecution based solely on the color of skin appear more hateful and hideous than in the capital of the United States? Now, she makes this statement uh, in um, uh, the early 20th century, right at the turn of the century. Um, and if you take it at face value, it's just not true. Um, lynchings are occurring on a regular basis in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina. Um, there are actually places in Alabama where people are being held in debt peonage that even the Justice Department agrees looks like slavery. In fact, that's, that's one, of the main, one of the first big cases that the Justice Department, after it's formed, takes on. Um, and that's all happening while she's making this statement. And yet she's saying that one of the places with the most affluent black communities in the country is in fact one of the places where American the violations of American democracy appear most hideous. The reason that she makes that statement uh, is because 
This is supposed to be the symbolic center of American democracy. Uh, and so even though the violations of American democracy based on race that she witnesses are in fact compared to other places in the country really quite tame by comparison. Uh, nonetheless, she finds them all the more offensive because this is where Amer Demo American democracy is supposed to be its most pure, its most pristine, and in fact it is nothing of the sort. And D.C. becomes a battleground. And a lot of times the national battles that are, that are taking place get fought out in and about D.C. I mean, we, we think about abolitionism, for example. You know, and a lot of folks, you know, up in Maine and elsewhere, they don't even realize that there were slaves in D.C. Lots of them, right? And, and actually, the abolitionist movement made D.C. the center mm -hmm. of their campaign. Right? William Lloyd Garrison, the famous white abolitionist, says D.C. is the first citadel, citadel to be carried in the battle to end slavery. Why? Well, for two reasons. One is it's symbolic of the country, right? And this, this slavery is a stain on our national reputation. We need, to, we, need, we need to remove it from the nation's capital. And the second reason is because we have no, they, D.C. has no voting rights, right? Congress is in control of the city. If Congress wanted to end slavery in the city, it could do so today. Right? It didn't have to go through the state legislature in Mississippi or, or anywhere else. Right? There was no argument about states' rights about anything. Congress could do it right away. And so Congress, and so the abolitionists very early on target Washington. They start flooding petitions uh, to, to Congress saying, end slavery in D.C. They weren't talking about end slavery. They said, end slavery in D.C. You have the power to do it. Do it now. And you can go in, in, the, in the archives here and, and elsewhere. Take out these petitions. They're still there. They're in big old boxes. Uh, and, and you can see these yellow ink petitions from, from every small town you can imagine, not just in the North, but in the South too, where, where people were writing in saying, Congress, end slavery in D.C., right? And so D.C. becomes this, this central focus of the abolitionist movement and the central focus of the pro-slavery movement. John C. Calhoun says, says D.C. is our thermopylae. We have to protect slavery in D.C. If we lose D.C., we lose it all. Mm -hmm. right? the, the state legislature in Georgia says in, in the 1950s, in the 1850s, says the number one thing that Congress could do that would make us secede would be to end slavery in D.C. Right? So this is a major issue. And they, they, this battle is being fought out. This national battle is being fought out in D.C., about D.C. That's why D.C. is so central to not just, it's not just important to learn it as local history. This is national history writ small right here on the streets of, of the city. And, you, and this, this goes on and, and, you know, in, in any number of different ways. And during school desegregation, after 1954, uh, in D.C. it was called Bowling v. Sharp. We had to have a special case, a companion to Brown v. Board of Education. Supreme Court declares segregated schools unconstitutional. And both pro- desegregation activists and anti-desegregation activists, the segregationists, both saw D.C. as central to that battle, right? You have even President Eisenhower saying, look, the Supreme Court has, has ruled we really have to make integration work in D.C. He, he, you know, he wasn't going to focus on Mississippi, Arkansas, all this stuff. He said 1954, we got to do it here because everybody's watching us in D.C., and the segregationists said the same thing. He said, everybody's watching what happens in D.C. And after desegregation happens, they hold this series of, of raucous and, and raunchy sometimes hearings in, in 1956 to try to display what they considered the perils of integration, of integrated schools. And they'd bring all these teachers and, all, and the, these white students talking about the fights and all the sexual innuendo and all this different stuff that they, that they said was a, was a natural outcome of, of desegregation. And so both segregationists and integrationists are fighting over D.C., right, because it's the capital. And so it, it is a national battleground for, for these national issues. So the city is a symbol. It's a battleground. Um, and just as importantly, it is also a laboratory. Uh, because Congress, under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, has final authority and oversight over D.C., whether there is a local government or not, and for you know, roughly half of the city's history there is not, roughly half of the city's history there is when it comes to local government. Um, Congress can impose laws on the district. If the city council passes a law that Congress does not like, it can void that law. It, of course, has to hold a vote and, and, and get a, a proper majority, but nonetheless, it can. Um, that means that for both the benefit 
and to the detriment of DC residents, uh, Congress can experiment with the city. And sometimes this works out wonderfully, I should just point out, right? Because uh, I know we all think about the bad times, particularly today. But in 1862, uh, Radical Republicans in Congress are seriously considering um, figuring out how to end slavery, uh, as is President Lincoln. Um, and so they come up with the D.C. Emancipation Act, which Chris pointed out earlier, uh, uh, is passed on April 16, 1862. Um, and it frees 3,000 plus African Americans here in the city. Um, that sets a precedent that fo is followed through with the Emancipation Proclamation and, of course, with the 13th Amendment, right? Uh, and so this policy that some Republicans wanted to take national, they try out here first. Same thing with black suffrage, the Negro Suffrage Act of 1866. Negro Suffrage Act of 1866 uh, precedes the 14th Amendment. It's tried out here, uh, and then they take it national, right? And in both of those instances, it enriches our democracy. It re-erases the stain of slavery from... Uh, uh, um, uh, American government, uh, and then it actually creates a true biracial democracy uh, a couple of years later. Uh, unfortunately, that swept away about 10 years after that, but nonetheless. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work out too well for us. Um, fast forward about 130 years, another group of radical Republicans come into office with the uh, Republican Revolution of 1994, um, and they want to try out all of these different conservative policies for helping the poor, that they quite frankly cannot get their entire caucus to pass for the entire country. I'll give you one example. Um, there's a, a small number of Republicans who really want to try out charter schools in the mid-1990s, and they do not have support within the majority of their caucus because a lot of the people in their caucus are from suburban districts that have great public school systems. And they were like, why would we want to undermine our public school system by putting them in competition with other people and taking students out of that system? It's a good system. And so they won't vote for charter school legislation that would go national. But the folks who favor charter schools are able to convince the rest of their caucus to impose charter schools on DC. Uh, and so in the mid-1990s, uh, the Republican majority uh, passes a bill, says you're going to have charter schools here in Washington, DC. Local elected officials say, no, no thank you. And they say, we don't care. Um, and fast forward uh, up to today, and half of DC students are in, pub are in charter schools. Um, the charter school board um, has absolutely no accountability to the local government. And so, you know, DC schools have, have been in uh, rough shape for a, a while now. Um, but the city government really struggles to try and write the system because half the students aren't in it these days. Um, and they literally have no control over those charter schools because Congress took that away from them, right? Um, and so you can see that this experimentation can go all sorts of ways. Um, but we also see the city as uh, a laboratory for what Congress would like to do. And, you know, people, uh, people will often ask, uh, you know, one of us will say, oh, you know, so what what do we need to learn from this? You know, what, what's the big takeaway? It's a, it's a good DC uh, you know, policy wonk term. What's the takeaway? What, what can you get? I have a, I have a friend who's always like, G you know, give me the 30 seconds. You know, what, what do I need to know? <laughs> and uh, you know, I always laugh because, it, because I think about that and, and I'm like, if you were asking the writer of a, of a detective novel, you know, mystery novel, and say, oh, you know, I heard you wrote this great mystery novel. Just tell me, who did it, right? <laughs> I can tell you who did it, right? The butler did it, right? With the, with the candlestick. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, but if I tell you that, you kind of missed the whole point, right? It's like, the point isn't to find out who did it, right? The point is to read the book, right? And, and, to, and, and to have the share in the suspense and try to figure things out for, your, for yourself, right? And try to, try to figure it out and put the pieces together and, 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 and figure out what, what is important to you. And so, I, you know, when people ask me that, I, my, my general response is, well, don't let me tell you what's most important, right? Go and explore and discover for yourself, right? And, then, and that's what we, you know, we certainly hope all of you all will do with this book is, uh, is, to, is to get the book and read it and discover. And I think what you'll find and maybe what will end is, is with our favorite stories, mm -hmm. but which, they're going to be different than your favorite stories from this book. This book is full of lots of incredible stories of, of really important people. I mean, 
you can't make some, some of this stuff up, right? I mean, you, know, you don't need to make stuff up because what, what really did happen is so interesting. Uh, and, and so I encourage you to, to explore the book and, and discover for yourself what you think is important. For me, uh, one of my favorite stories uh, is, is the story of, of, of the freeways, right? Not a very sexy topic. Freeways, right? There's been a bunch of concrete. But if those of you from DC, like, you know, if you if you've driven into DC or if you've come to DC on Highway 395 coming up from the south, and you come through and you you plow through Southwest and you go right under, under the Capitol, what happens when you go under the Capitol? Stop. You're going 60 miles an hour. Stop. You stop at New York Avenue. You get to New York Avenue and there's a red light. And you're like, man, what what's going on? Right? I was, I've been going 65 since since you know Key West. And, and now I get to, to D.C. and I got to stop. And the reason for that is this remarkable movement uh, led by a couple of really extraordinary people. And so, so the thing about, about the freeways that you have to understand is the freeways were inevitable. Uh, you know, as many things are, are we're, we're often told that something's inevitable. Well, it's inevitable. It's just going to happen. Gentrification, it's inevitable. The, the wealthy are going to come back, displace the poor. It's inevitable. Nothing you can do about it. Freeways, same way. In the 1950s, 1960s, everybody knew that freeways were going to happen. The politicians loved them. It was perfect for pork, right? They would appropriate millions of dollars to all their favorite buddies. The contractors and businessmen loved it because they would get these contracts, spend the next decade, you know, building these tremendous projects. Urban planners loved it because they got to, you know, play around with all these visionary drawings. Uh, the press loved it, right? This was going to be great for the city. Progress, growth, right? Uh, we were going to get all these shoppers back to the city. We we're going to build these freeways. Uh, and they had these grand plans, right? You know one of them is the, the Beltway that goes Goes around, right? Our beautiful Beltway. We all love the Beltway, don't we? Uh, right? Well, that was just the beginning, okay? That, they, there was going to be the Beltway, then they were going to have the inner loop. It's not the inner loop like we call it today. It's, it was going to be a small Beltway inside, right along F Street, right all along downtown. Ten lanes, nice, beautiful highway. You'd love it, I'm sure, all right? And right through downtown. And then, of course, well, you've got to connect the two. So you've got this one out in the suburbs. You've got this Beltway in the middle. You've got to connect them with ten lane highways going out to through the neighborhoods of D.C. to connect them, right? Congress appropriated the money, done deal. Well, the plans land on the lap of this little white guy named Sammy Abbott. Bald, glasses, got to love a guy like that, right? Uh, and he was a little older than me. His glasses were a little thicker. And he sees the plans, and his wife points out, he's like, you know, that North Central Freeway, that's coming through our front yard, Right? He lived in Tacoma Park, right across the district line, Tacoma Park, Maryland. And Sammy looks at his wife, Ruth, and they say, this ain't going to happen, right? we got to stop this. And so they just start knocking on doors. And now, mind you, he's just a random artist, uh, you know, in Tacoma Park, Maryland. He has no power, right? He doesn't have millions, right? He doesn't have a pack. He, you know, he, doesn't, he has no way to, 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 to stop this. This is already a done deal. Okay, so it's completely futile what he's doing. So he starts knocking on the doors of his neighbors, and he says, look, you know, have you seen the plans? So you, this whole neighborhood is going to be destroyed. we got to stop it. Uh, and so they say, okay, well, they get together. They start doing little protests. Everybody ignores them. Uh, and then they, they start following the freeway down, and they say, well, look, you know, let's look. Oh, Tacoma, D.C. Oh, Brooklyn, D.C. Like, all these neighborhoods are going to be completely flattened. Mm -hmm. Right? So they start knocking on those doors, and, and black folks answer them. A lot, a lot of low-income black folks start answering the doors, and, say, and they say, look, you know, you got, we got to join together. Your neighborhood's going to be flattened. And they start building a movement, and, and Sammy Abbott finds this guy named Reginald Booker. Tall, lean, black guy, uh, big gaffro, uh, and you know, very good looking, very good looking. Uh, you know, black sunglasses, dashiki, he's like the embodiment of the black power nationalists in the late 1960s. So you got, you got Reginald Booker, you got Sammy Abbott, uh, you, and they are quite a pair walking around, and they are crazy, right? And that's, in fact, the, the word that the black columnist William Raspberry of the Washington Post says. He's like, Sammy Abbott and Reginald Booker are crazy, but because they're crazy, we may just have a chance. Right, we may just have a chance to save our city. And they were. So the city would come through with eminent domain and say, we're claiming this house for eminent domain. The freeway's coming through. Out you go. They'd board it up. Sammy Abbott and, and, and Reginald Booker would come through with crowbars and unboard them. They would have unboarding parties and they'd bring all the neighborhood out. They'd unboard the houses, sweep them all up, put people back in. City comes through, removes them again. They, everywhere the, the freeway bulldozers went, Sammy Abbott, Reginald Booker would have 50 people there, right? Chaining themselves to trees and houses and stuff, saying, you can't 
move forward. Like you will not build here. And then they started filing lawsuits one after another. They got the wealthy white lawyers on the west side of the park to join in. They said, come on, we need your expertise. You got to work the inside game. We work the outside game. We got to work on this together. And they filed one lawsuit after another and they started to win. And those bulldozers stopped. And so what was inevitable in 1964 becomes impossible by 1972. And now 50 years later, it's unthinkable. We couldn't imagine a beltway going through downtown DC with 10 lane highways going through our neighborhoods. We just couldn't imagine it because these folks saw fit to organize together across lines of class, across lines of race, across geographic lines, Maryland and Virginia, Maryland and DC, fighting together to stop this thing. So that, that's one of the stories I really like. Mm. So, so my, my story has a, a, a similar subtext, uh, and I'm going to talk about Walter Fontroy. Uh, he, you know, if Walter Fontroy is, is, uh, still lives uptown. Uh, he is unfortunately in, in, in ill health, and so you seldom see him out anymore. Uh, but he was a D.C. native, grew up in uh, what we now call Shaw, not too far from 9th Street. I used to race in soapbox derbies and all those things. Um, uh, went to um, uh, New Bethel Baptist Church, and in fact, after uh, he got his law degree from Yale University, uh, he came on back and he was going to become the pastor of uh, New Bethel. Uh, he really quickly gets swept up in the civil rights movement, um, distinguishes himself as, as you know, sort of the host uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, chair for the March on Washington, really gets to know all of these media contacts, uh, develops a, a national network of people. Uh, and he is later on in the late 1960s tapped to be a part of the appointive city council. Um, he then, in 1971, decides to run for the non voting delegate seat uh, after it's created by President Nixon uh, in the uh, House of Representatives. Now, I want to be very clear about this seat, and it's the one that Eleanor Holmes Norton holds today. It is, on paper, an entirely powerless office. You are a member of Congress who cannot vote on legislation. And the closest that Eleanor Holmes Norton could get with a little deal uh, with the Democratic leadership back in, in the, the early 90s before Republicans took over is that she was going to be allowed to vote on the floor on legislation, but her vote would not count if, in fact, it broke a tie. <laughs> You're with me, right? <laughs> um, and so Walter Fauntroy takes these basically powerless elective positions, right? And he does it because he's thinking beyond the office. He looks around and he says, how can I create power for a powerless jurisdiction, for a powerless office? And the first thing he thinks of is, OK, there's this guy named John McMillan. He's a congressman from the 6th District in South Carolina, unregenerate racist, has a little, little rebel figure uh, in gray. Uh, on, a, on a cartoon, first thing when you walk into his office, right? Uh, freely uses the N-word to reporters on the record, right? In the 60s. Uh, and he is the chair of the DC committee in the House of Representatives. <laughs> and for a solid two decades, any major bill that comes through his committee to give the city a vote of some sort gets killed. A couple slips through, the school board, non-voting delegate position, when there's just overwhelming opposition. But basically, he's able to kill everything that gives us something approximating a city government. Um, and Walter Fontroy says, OK, I'm gonna about to be this guy's uh, colleague in Congress. And in the institution, on Capitol Hill, I can't do a thing to him. What am I going to trade votes with him? I don't have a vote to trade. right? Um, so what he decides to do is go find all of these black churches in South Carolina in the 6th District. He says, you know, now in 1971, those folks can vote, right? Six years before, they couldn't. But black folks are 20% of his constituents. And so I'm going to load up buses of volunteers in DC, send them down to South Carolina, knock on every black person's door in the entire district, work through all the churches, and get black folks out for anybody else for that position. First time they run an African-American against him in 1970, um, he loses. It's, you know, it's an 80% white district. That's not going to happen in South Carolina in, in uh, 1970. 
1972, a, a liberal white challenger uh, comes out against Johnny Mac. Walter Fontroy brings in Coretta Scott King, Ralph Abernathy, volunteers from district. Uh, John McMillan is like, what in God's name is happening here, right? Um, literally, there's, there's this great television footage of him where he just looks shell-shocked. He's like, well, somebody brought out the Negro vote. Um, and they beat him. And the white man who goes to Congress owes his election to Walter Fauntroy, right? And says, I would be glad to be a friend of the District of Columbia when y'all need me, for obvious reasons. Um, Fauntroy then turns around, and the beauty is that when Johnny Mac gets defeated, uh, Charlie Diggs, uh, African-American congressman from Detroit, co-founder of the Congressional Black Caucus with Walter Fauntroy, becomes the chair of the D.C. House uh, Committee. And so the first thing he does is sits down and writes the Home Rule Bill. And within a year, we get elections. First city government in the city in 100 years, right? All done by a gentleman with a powerless office, right? Starts to get good to him. We got a city government. So in 1976, he says, shoot, y'all, let's go ahead and get two senators and a member of Congress, right? Says, let's, and he literally says, let's mend the crack in the Liberty Bell. Right? Shows up to a Democratic National Convention with a tricorn hat uh, and a you know, crazy uh, jacket looking like a revolution, uh, war for independent soldier uh, and delivers uh, a, a request uh, for a D.C. voting rights amendment. Amendment to the Constitution that would say D.C. should be treated like a state uh, uh, for matters of congressional representation. Um, and they wage this two-year campaign. Um, and they, they, they actually lose in 1976, but they really start to get traction in 1978. And it's because they do some really clever stuff, like going back to basics. Strom Thurmond, powerful South Carolina senator, right, is up for re-election in 1978. This is most difficult competition uh, to date. And Walter Fontroy calls up Jesse Jackson. So Jesse, man, you know, I know you're from South Carolina. I know you know a person or two down there. I want you to walk around and tell them that Strom Thurmond is a bad person um, and that they need to come out and vote against him unless he heads down to the well of the Senate and not only gives a speech in support of the D.C. Voting Rights Amendment, but starts to go get his buddies to go vote for it, too. Strom Thurmond realizes that he will lose this race if black voters come out in large numbers against him. So he goes down and gives a speech, says D.C. Voting Rights Amendment is a human rights issue. This is Strom Thurmond, a segregationist, y'all, <laughs> just so we're clear, right? Um, he then says, hey, Barry Goldwater, I really need you to vote for this, man. Barry comes on board. He is able to get a couple of other hardcore conservative senators to vote for this piece of legislation, and it passes. Passes, right? Heads to the states. Um, and unfortunately, a conservative movement rises up in the states you know, it already sort of gained its chops fighting against the ERA, and they really go hard after the D.C. Voting Rights Amendment, and they're able to kill it in the years ahead. Um, but the fact that D.C., almost no money, no vote in Congress, uh, no professional lobbyists, at least not ones that are working for us on, 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 on the clock, right, is able to get um, an amendment through Congress, giving us two senators and a member of Congress, and a member of the House, right, was a remarkable success. Um, and what we really hope that, that these stories give all of you uh, are not just inspiration for what's possible in this place where it seems like these things are not possible, but also something approximating a blueprint for how we can deal with these ongoing problems today. Uh, so thank you all so much. <laughs>
Sure. Um, first of all, I thought you properly lauded, excuse me, my opponent's calling, mm -hmm. uh, properly lauded, um, or properly described, the indifferent role, uh, when you talk about race, of the first African-American president toward the District of Columbia. Mm. For four years, he did not put the license plate, taxation mm. without representation, on the presidential limousine that Sarah Shapiro created and I kind of sold mm -hmm. to Bill Clinton and, and uh, George Bush took it off. He never spoke to D.C. about D.C. Mm -hmm. He never spoke to D.C. about D.C. And uh, he ignored us for eight years. And this is somebody you talk about, Adrian Fenty, who won every precinct in the city mm -hmm. four times, mm -hmm. twice for the Democratic nomination. When the license plate went on, it was not done by the mayor. It was done by Mary Che, the Ward 3 council member, mm. who went to the White House. Mm. One mistake, and I don't think I've ever publicly done this, uh -oh. is say good things about a Republican. <laughs> you get it wrong. I was, I'm, I'm remarkably well preserved, but 25 years ago, I was at the statehood vote, November 21st, 1993. And I'm mentioning his name, and I almost feel uncomfortable doing this, because of the fact of, uh, I, I never say anything good about a Republican, but you in the book say not one Republican voted for statehood. Wayne Gilchrist, mm. the Republican from the eastern shore of Maryland, and he used to, when I was on the radio, say, stop bringing this up, you're killing me, and he ended up losing in a primary. I bring up his name because he walked over to Delegate Norton, the sole Republican, Wayne Gilchrist, and said, it's a question of dignity. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a grievous omission not to use his name. You go up to 2010, I'm almost done, and I think you leave out, you talked about Bowling versus Sharp. You leave out a case that we tried to do something about through the courts. It was Alexander versus Daly, and I won't go into the in entire situation. But I think you have to know also the villains who maybe you're too polite not to mention in your book. There was a three-judge panel. This was our Brown versus Board of Education to get voting representation uh, through the courts. And they said, you have a remedy. The person who wrote the opinion and voted against us was Merrick Garland. These are friends, supposedly, who was nominated by President Obama. He voted no and then wrote the opinion. Louis mm -hmm. Oberdorfer was the one who said yes. And I'm telling this story since you told those stories because I think it goes probably to my central point. I once asked Jesse Jackson when he was the elected statehood senator here, when will it ever change? He says when it rises to the level of personal insult. And one of the, meaning the citizenry of D.C., and your book mm -hmm. tells that story. We aren't angry enough or insulted enough, and we don't know who the villains are. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a fellow Jewish person like me, is going on her victory tour 25, 25 years. The decision by the, the three-judge panel goes to the Supreme Court for cert, whether they will give us a hearing. Not to vote yes or no, will they give us a hearing? And I happened to go to UDC that day because Shelley Broderick was trying to get the law school accredited. Mm. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg is there the very day they granted, they, they didn't grant cert to us. They wouldn't hear our case. They wouldn't even give us a hearing. And I'm telling the story I've written about in The Hill, but I'm telling the story because I want it widely disseminated so people know that there are people who have held us back, stood in our way, who are supposed liberal progressive champions who've screwed us. I mean, I mean, there's no other way to say it. And I said to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, just like this microphone, I said, I'm surprised you showed up here today on this very day you voted against us. And she had these nice white gloves, and she said, you don't know how I voted. 
I said, well, tell us how you voted. Did you vote for to hear a hearing or not? She would not answer. Hmm. Justice John Paul Stevens, who I'm particularly fond of because he went to my high school in Chicago, publicly dissented, said, I want to hear that case. Well, finally, well, if, finally. Well, if, fi if we could just say can this, I just, though. I just finally, finally. In, you, you only go up to 2010, so I'll excuse you. But in 2014, <laughs> the Democrats controlled the U.S. Senate, not the House. Tom Carper, the bill went to Carper's committee. He's a Democrat. He introduced the bill. They, Harry Reid, the majority leader, became a co-sponsor of the bill. And I went up to Delegate Norton and said, have you gone to see Claire McCaskill and Mark Pryor, two uncommitted senators who were on the committee, we would get the first vote ever in the U.S. Senate. We were in the majority in 2014. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, you go see them. That's the problem. Thank you for your patience, and I hope I've added to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, <laughs> So, so I'll, I will just make one plug in, in, in reply, um, and thank you for, for pointing out the uh, 93 vote uh, 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 omission. Um, we do, we, we of course couldn't co cover everything. And so what we did, and, and, and Chris always points this out with me because was, I was particularly bad on this score, um, is that we, we had these huge files of, of stuff we cut out. Uh, you know, the book was bigger, if you can imagine. Um, and, in certain cases, when we thought the information was really important, we, we were able to dump it into to articles. And so uh, the last issue, uh, not, not, no, 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 the current, yeah. art, the current issue of Washington History Magazine, which doesn't refer to Merrick Garland uh, uh, by name, but does refer to his decision, uh, and in fact quotes it, uh, covers that, that period. And, and so that is one of the difficulties of, of, of writing you know, something so large. I mean, this is not a statehood book, right? It's, it's a book about race but and democracy in D.C. Yes. Uh, and, but so we, we were able to at least write a, write a, write a breakout article on statehood. Um, and so, uh, yes. <laughs> Peace. Peace to the house. <laughs> Hello. You know, you guys are great. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. I, you know, it is the dialogue. You have to use the microphone. I'm, is the microphone on? Yes. yes. You can hear it. Yes. Thank you. I was taught elocution without a microphone. But anyway, um, you guys are great. And, and one thing that Dr. Tolson from Wiley College taught us, always commend people initially. <laughs> <laughs> and then kick their assets all the way to the Hoover Dam. Um, I appreciate, why don't I say it like this? From 1975 to 1983, I worked on the Senate side of the Hill. Mm -hmm. My first job there, and I'm not getting into the cult of the individual, my first job there was a Senate elevator operator because I didn't want to be a gopher in Senator Haskell's office. So many of the people who are talked about on the Hill at that time, some of us rubbed shoulders with them by virtue of us being in the story. But I'm, I'm thankful um, to uh, Chris and George, who I call them Messiah Earth. For those who know how to, you know, George means Earth and Chris means Christ means Messiah for some of us. But I'm thankful for how you are telling the stories. And we got to get the stories out and wider. And I'm thankful for the gentleman earlier. That's a wider portion of the stories, but you can only put so much in a book. And also, politics plays real strange bedfellows. Yes. But I would like to, for you to entertain, hopefully, one of these two questions or both of them. One, there's something that's called the Bible Way Bend of Bishop Williams mm -hmm. in terms of the major highway mm -hmm. that was supposed to run through that place. And the reason why I'm going there is that there's something that happened prior to 1872 in terms of the African descendant community in doing our own independent sort of stuff under tremendous horrific circumstances. 
how do we recapture that? It won't be through Chris and George only, but it will be through those who know the stories and who can pick up the profoundness of how did they do it mm -hmm. under horrific situations and stop talking about what happens to 45. What are you going to do on your side of the chessboard even though you have to deal with the anatomy and the kinesiology of 45 or 44 or 43. Could you address that? And if you can address the role of Nanny Helen Burroughs in organizing over 100,000 women and 10,000 families. <laughs> well, thank you for the, for the commentary and the questions. Uh, so you mentioned 1872. What happened before 1872? Is it, it, important time in certainly in DC history and and you know the, the reconstruction era deserves a whole book on its own you know we, we uh we spend a fair bit of time talking about reconstruction because it was so important you know this is this is the era after the the negro suffrage act is packed, passed in 1866 where african-american men for the first african-american men in the country really are ex exercising the right to vote they join with radical republicans white radical republicans uh and they form an interracial coalition that that comes to run the city uh, and so you have uh, black voters, white voters joining together, get together to vote a white abolitionist, Sales Bowen, into the mayor's office in 1868. Uh, and they, they uh, black voters and white voters together vote for black city office holders. You have a guy, George uh, Hatton, who in 1862 was, an, in, was enslaved in PG County. He gets free, to, gets free, he joins the Union Army, gets wounded in the Battle of Petersburg. He comes back to D.C. Uh, with a limp and a chip on his shoulder, and he says, I'm going to help run this city. He dives into, into the local politics, starts organizing, uh, gets elected to the city council, and helps pass uh, a series of anti-discrimination statutes uh, that basically bar segregation from public businesses. Uh, these laws, which are later dropped from the DC code when it's compiled in 1901, become the legal foundation for the, for the post-World War II civil rights movement in this city, right? And that happened because of black voters organizing in, in the 1860s and early 1870s and working together in these, these cross-race coalitions to, to run the city. It's the conservative counter-revolution in the years afterward that strips away the right to vote from both black men and white men and strips the city entirely of, of all elected offices. Uh, and then it's, you know, then it's another hundred years in the wilderness, so to speak, where, where we have three, uh, three commissioners running the city. Uh, but this period of reconstruction is a really important time, uh, you know, th th this window of opportunity for, for interracial democracy that then gets slammed shut uh, by, by the imposition of white supremacy in the 1870s. And this happens across the South, uh, not just in DC. Yeah. Um, what about uh, the Bible way? The Bible way, it's a, it's a great story. Uh, you know, and that's, it's similar to the story about the freeways. So, so Bishop Williams says, you know, he basically calls up Hubert Humphrey. He knows Senator Humphrey in the, in the Senate. And he says, look, this highway that, that you all are planning to build, 395, is coming right through my church. You can't do that. And he gets, he gets the plans changed. And so the, the highway skirts the, the church property. Uh, it really, is, it's kind of an, an extraordinary example of, of, of you know, personal power assertion, right? you, of, of, of using the, the power of, a, of your personal connections. And, and again, this is a time when D.C. doesn't have the right to vote, so it's yeah. not like he can call his own senator, because D.C. doesn't have one. But he calls Hubert Humphrey, who's, who's known as a liberal senator from Minnesota, uh, who's you know, aspiring to have a national, uh, you know, a more nationally prominent image. And so Humphrey does... Step in. Some What's that? Could some he yes. could definitely use some brownie <laughs> points. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah. There's a, one more. We, oh. We've pretty much run over. Oh. Uh, so the last two gentlemen that were already in place, uh, questions only, no comments. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we'll keep the answers quick. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to. Just really quick, thank you all for memorializing uh, DC history in 600 pages and for this enlightening talk because. Uh, with all the development and possibly Amazon HQ2, I worry that DC is losing a lot of history and culture. The question is, um, uh, what what is co-authoring a book look like, and what kind of sources did you all use? I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean. Like, yeah. how does that how's sure. the interplay work and the interaction sure. and stuff? 
Uh, we'll try to keep it short. <laughs> yeah. uh, it looks it looks it looks sort of messy. Uh, it, you know, and, and I think the, the thing that that we really leaned on uh, before we tried to figure out the actual um, ins and outs of, of co-authoring was uh, to make sure that we had each other's trust, uh, to make sure that our friendship was strong, and to work on it through the process. Because when it comes down to it, writing is hard if you're doing it by yourself. When you're doing it with someone else, it's, it's very hard. Uh, <laughs> you, you add to that the fact that, that we had three children in the course of this book. Um, we already had two when we started. Um, we both got new houses. Uh, I had to stop writing for a while because I got a new job. Chris moved to Maine. I mean, so it was, it was really sort of crazy. And you know, the one thing that we could count on when the, the actual uh, uh, sort of um, structure that we had created to write the book began to, to either shake or just fall apart was an actual trust in each other, right? Uh, and so we were constantly talking about what we needed, what was possible. Um, and then we, you know, we, just, we tried to divvy it up best we could um, and, uh, and then edit with each other a lot. Uh, and so that, that's why it still feels uniform, even though there were two, peop- two voices. And in terms of sources, uh, you know, we, we build on a, uh, you know, we stand atop a mountain of, of research. There's mm-hmm. great research on D.C., a lot of wonderful articles, a lot of local historians. D.C. has a great local history scene uh, of, you know, not, non-scholars, you know, they're called, not, they're not scholars or academics, but they're fantastic historians who, who've been unearthing uh, neighborhood histories for, for the last four decades. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we build on a lot of that, oral histories, uh, and, and of course some of the, the, the secondary source materials there. And you know, we do a lot of research in, that are available here at the archives and, and at the Library of Congress uh, and online. I mean, a, lot of the, a lot of the old newspapers, the Washington Bee, Washington Star, these are, these are digitized now. Mm-hmm. So I'm not from here, I'm from Ohio. And when I first moved here, I heard people reference Chocolate City a lot. And oftentimes they would say, well, it's not much Chocolate City anymore. Mm-hmm. And you were saying that gentrification is inevitable. And it's going to happen. So I wanted to know what ways do you all believe are ways for people to mobilize so that they can combat gentrification? It's a great question. So I, I was saying that as the lead up to my story about the highways, right? You know, that's what they said about the highways, right? It's inevitable. There's nothing you can do about them. Uh, and yet citizen opposition stopped the highways, you know, cold. Uh, and so people say gentrification is inevitable now, the same way they talked about freeways. It's just going to happen. The big money's there. The politicians support it. You know, the, the, you know, it's growing the tax base, et cetera. There's nothing you can do about it. And I think our response is, is you know, looking at history that maybe they're wrong. You know, what seems inevitable at one particular point in time maybe isn't so inevitable if there's enough concerted, organized opposition on the, on the ground level to protect what people consider important. If they consider it important for people to stay in place and to take care of, uh, of neighborhoods, uh, then you mobilize around those, those issues. Um, and, very, and, and by the way, I mean, this is, this is not the first time this, this gentrification story is being told, right? I mean, we wrote a, a standalone article, another, another time we had to take stuff out of the book, um, that looks at four different waves of gentrification that have washed over the cities, city in the last uh, 100 years. I mean, gentrification starts as a phenomenon that's recognizable in Georgetown in the, in the late 20s. Uh, and so there are ways that people have tried to deal with gentrification in the past, particularly during the wave that hit the city in the 70s, um, that were effective for some folks. I mean, one of the reasons that Columbia Heights and Adams Morgan look the way they do with a, a significant degree of, of ethnic and, and uh, economic diversity is because people in those communities fought gentrification in the 70s and out of that process came a large number of cooperative apartment buildings uh, where poor people banded together and with the help of the city through low interest loans bought their buildings. But one of the things that they had to have in that moment were housing activists and lawyers who were willing to help them take advantage of city laws, which they demanded from the city that would then allow them to stay in place and buy their buildings. Um, we have the laws on the books still. We don't necessarily have as robust an infrastructure. Uh, and so you don't see the pushback that you did uh, 40, 50 years ago, but it absolutely is possible. Uh, and and that's, that's critical to understand. Thank you all so much. And I believe we, we will be signing books uh, upstairs. We'll be signing books